Welcome back to the second part of today's symposium on age and aging and society of the Project for an Aging World Plus, which is an interdisciplinary art platform typhoon project. Hello, Internet. My name is Peter Grabowski. I'm a cultural political reporter and I am your host today. So far, we have heard some basic things about age and aging, society, social policy, scientific policy and biological views, but also sociological and Ms. Van Dyke's some morally philosophical perspective. And now we are going to focus on the intercultural differences between two states and societies that on our planet are almost the maximum distance apart, but they are very close nevertheless. In no other industrialized country in the world I think I may say so. The average age is so high as in Japan or in Germany. It always depends on your perspective again. The average age, you know, some talk about the mean age and the average age, so it becomes quite complex. Nevertheless, this closeness when it comes to this phenomenon uh, is something that almost um, the sociologist Shingo Shimada deals with almost his entire life as a researcher. He um, holds the chair of modern Japan at the Heinrich Heine University here in Düsseldorf. And he deals with cultural differences in soci societies, especially with the aging society in Japan. Whether and what we can learn something from this is his topic now for the next three quarters of an hour the floor is yours professor shimango shimada thank you very much for this kind introduction and also for the invitation to this very interesting event Maybe I may start with my personal background. When Mark Franz sent me an email in January this year, I was actually in Japan dealing with exactly this very topic. My mother is 92 years old. She lives in Tokyo all by herself. And it turned out at the end of the last year that she was suffering from dementia or she started to suffer from it. When I got the email, it, I was there in order to help her with her situation, to deal with care and with um, assuran insurance and some of you may know it, you know how much red tape you meet whenever you apply for insurance, care insurance and so on. And suddenly I was in a situation per quite personally to be in a Japanese um, society. Um, it's in Rogo Kaigo in Japan is an old means that an old person cares for another old person. There's actually um, a term for that. And I was researching and then suddenly I was in this situation myself and then I got the email on top of that. And to be honest, I wasn't in a position to answer to that email right away. Anyways, the situation normalized in a way and I flew back to Germany and I'm quite happy to be able to be here today and to be allowed to de be here. So that's just some personal background. So I actually deal with this topic and have been dealing with this topic 
for 20 years now, maybe? And another reason was that in the year 2000, there was an obligatory or mandatory care insurance introduced in Germany uh, and then in Japan. And there were a few intercultural transfer relationships, knowledge transfer, terminology transfer. So we, we had a lot of exchange in that field. So I was quite interested in this topic. Apart from the fact that, of course, an aging society or aging societies in Germany and Japan are a politically pressing matter. And today we have heard a couple of times about the demographic development and that it is similar in both states. However, in Japan, the demographic development is a bit more severe, if you will. So what, when it comes to aging in Germany, when we talk about the, when we, we you know, it took 75 years in Germany for a demographic change and in Japan it took just 20 years. So 20 years ago Japan was actually one of the youngest uh, populations among industrialized countries and 25 years later the Japanese society was the oldest. So you can see the speed of aging here and also the speed this society needs to deal with and has problems in dealing with. So for this situation in Japan, um, you know, it, it is quite severe. And against this backdrop, I would like to give you some examples, uh, an example of how people deal with people with dementia and compare this to Germany. And I brought along, well, actually, in, in 2013 to 2016, I did an empirical study on this topic, a field study, an ethnographically oriented study in a Japanese nursing home compared to a Düsseldorf nursing home. But of course, I won't have the time to go into much detail here due to the time slot and the time problem, if you will. And when it comes to the empirical um, facts, then I will concentrate on the Japanese society. I think this is more interesting to you anyways. So we're dealing with the German-Japanese comparison. The first question that arises is what cultural factors are we looking at? And I wouldn't want to directly start answering that question because Japan from a German perspective, has always been very foreign. And it, it has always been associated with a very foreign culture. And I think it's important to highlight other structures, for example, social structures, because there are also huge differences that not necessarily have something to do with cultures or should have something to do with cultures. Another important factor when it comes to the comparison of the aging societies is that in Japan, for example, there is a certain level of charities that we know very well here in Germany, but this is lacking in Japan, actually. Just imagine, it's a very important factor in our German society, charities. And these charities, you know, you may 
think about them what you want, but they fulfill a very important task in the field of care services, nursing services. And in the year 2000, when, when the uh, care insurances were introduced in Japan, this entire block was lacking, something that we offer by charities here in Germany. So it was a huge gap that needed to be filled over the next 20 years. But you can see that when we talk about the mandatory care insurance, then this care insurance in both societies has a completely different meaning. I, I just wanted to point that out when it comes to the structures and the structural differences of Germany and Japan. And when we take a look at the cultural level, I would like to use an example that we used in the empirical study or that we examined in that framework. So you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Now, this is a nursing home for people with dementia in Japan. And I think this looks quite interesting from your perspective, from a German perspective. And it's closely related to a traditional form of living. It looks like a family home keeping in mind that people with dementia need to feel at home or can feel at home here. That was the idea behind this, uh, the, the nursing home. So they chose this traditional architecture, if you will. And this is the place where we did our research for our empirical study on people with dementia. And we lived with them in this house, actually. But I have to tell you that here we experienced, and I will talk about that in detail uh, very soon, we experienced how we should cohabitate ideally and how should we should deal with them ideally. It was a quite positive experience. Nevertheless, once again, I need to point out that this nursing home, compared to regular nursing homes in Japan, is not representative. This is not a typical nursing home in Japan. We actually deliberately chose this one to have a good example, but this example is not representative of the standard in Japanese society compared to other nursing homes. Now, the quality and the care for people with dementia was accepted, so it became a model, or a model was developed, and from this model, a concept was created. It's a small, multifunctional nursing home which is supported and which was institutionalized by the ministry and now this kind of nursing home became an example for for other nursing homes in the past 20 years so actually it did have a good effect it does have uh, the character of being an example for a nursing home in Japanese society. Now, what was special in this nursing home? What does multifunctional mean? This nursing home combines three functions. First, it's daycare, so that means up to 10 or 15 people with dementia can 
come to this nursing home for the day. Second function is house calls. So carers will make a house call whenever is necessary. And they go to the patients, if you will, and help them in their household. They support them. And this nursing home in the back has also some facilities to stay overnight. Now here it was three to four persons who stayed there overnight for a longer or shorter period of time and a few lived there all the time. Now, now the usage of this nursing home is quite diverse, quite flexible. And they try to respect the the, de the requirements, the, de the, the needs of the patients and also their families, which I find quite special. And that enables a certain, enables the, pa the patients to live their life in a familiar environment for a certain period of time and also their family members and to support their family members in their care work. And socially, political and politically in general, there are the, there are there is the willingness to have a nursing home that enables a certain bond between the patients and the carers and amongst them some sort and there's also some neighborhood help so the ideal behind it would be that in every residential area there is such a small nursing home where neighbors can help, where you have the community as a support system, helping in the care of people with dementia and also be a, um, a place for meeting a meeting point as well. In Düsseldorf, some of you might know the Centrum Plus. It's quite similar, but of course it does not offer this care service as the one in Japan. Culturally speaking, I find quite interesting that this house, as you can see from the outside, it's pretty well, it, it's, it's quite open according to Japanese architecture. And people who know what it's like in practical, what helps with people with who, who like to go out, you know, people with dementia, but who like to go for a walk and then they are lost. They're disoriented. They wander around. What help happens when that happens in, a, in such an, a nursing home? Well, basically, all doors are open here. They are not closed and not locked. The, the principle of this nursing home is that if a person leaves the house, then one care staff tries to join them until this person is exhausted and wants to go back to the nursing home. So that's what they are aiming at. If, if it always happens and if it's always possible, I don't know, because it demands a lot of the care staff. And it's also a disadvantage. What we, fi we found out that these uh, requirements towards the care staff was very, very, well, they were very high. But this is um, a scene during the day. There are some younger women, there are the nurses, and also the, the patients, the users of this nursing home. But basically, it's a, a regular 
standard um, everyday situation. You can't really see who's the patient, who's the nurse, and basically what they are doing here is everyday life. They drink tea, they eat a snack, and another scene that might be interesting, how open the architecture actually is. It's a typical Japanese architecture, so towards the garden, it's very open. Of course, in the winter time, you know, it's not possible to sit on the porch, but during the rest of the year, everything's open, the doors are open. And this is what is offered to the patients. Now, what did we learn from this field research? Well, I can only give you a very brief summary of what we learned. Well, it may be quite an abstract, at abstract level, we learned how well or that suffering from dementia, according to my interpretation, is a difficulty when it comes to being respected in society because a person with dementia usually cannot or does not always recognize the person they're talking with. And then, you know, you're insecure. What kind of role can I play in this communication? <coughs> and in this nursing home, what they did is, according to the sociological classic, we all play theater. We do a play. Everyone in society is on a stage, if you will, but here, the people with dementia are given the freedom to play their roles that they feel familiar with. So they might, of course, then you need to do some biographical house uh, homework, if you will. You know, who is this person? What kind of role did they play in the past? What was important to them to understand why they act like that? And we had a few examples. So f there was a teacher who worked in school for 40 years and he, p he acted as a teacher in this nursing home. So the nurses play along and they were the pupils. And for this person, for the teacher, it helped him feel secure. He acted in the role as a teacher. He felt secure in the role of a teacher. He knew how to reward the pupils, how to talk to them. So you do need an understanding of different roles. And the nursing care, the, uh, the nursing staff, the care staff did play along. And maybe this brings us to the aesthetical park today, I don't know. But there are other examples for role plays, numerous examples that we experienced. And then I understood how important role plays are in such situations. And surprisingly enough, what we experienced was also for people with severe cases of dementia who actually couldn't talk anymore and how they reacted to um, to when the nurses acted according to their roles. That was quite surprising to me and it, it gave me some food for thought. And based on this experience, and also in the theoretical reflection from this project, we held long discussions 
und auch äh, als wir von dort zurück And when we came back from our stay there we had a look at German institutions or nursing homes and it was quite frappant when you saw the differences in nursing care you know there's um, there's autonomy in Germany that's the first the first priority in, in the German system when it comes to people with dementia autonomy is very important and I don't have anything against this and when I'm in old age I want to be autonomous of course however in this situation or we we compared these two situations so in Japan there was no autonomy or that it didn't play a role it wasn't important in Japan but rather this social role play and in this project we had long discussions on this aspect and we found one thing quite striking if we in a society put a high priority on autonomy then of course dementia is quite tragical it's a tragic disease because you lose any precondition for autonomy which is a tragedy here where this concept of autonomy or self-determination or individual responsibility plays such a central role here the people were able to fulfill their social roles in a playful way. Mr. Kruse already said what I'm going to repeat, even in the context of dementia, even if you're suffering from dementia, there is an offer, the social environment will support you. So this situation again becomes worth living, worth enjoying. And maybe, maybe there is such a social value, self-determination and autonomy are important. However, positive values such as autonomy or individual responsi responsibility might have the effect of a burden too, especially in the early onset of dementia, when people realize that they're losing abilities, that they're losing this ability to be autonomous. Well, maybe that is something uh, we've learned. We've started to look at and reflect upon values such as this one. And this, of course, harbors the question as well, what is a, an appropriate way of dealing with dementia? There are two things I would like to highlight in this respect, according or after having done this research project. This uh, is actually all I'm going to leave you with. So much on a comparison between the cultural approach in Japan and Germany. Thank you very much.